I was absolutely delighted when Anne was awarded a personal chair. This was back on the 18th of the 9th, 2017, and I know she was worried we didn't have a record of it, but we did. She's earned this through hard work, diligence, commitment, and her success crosses many, many areas. I'm personally delighted that Anne has received this chair. Because during my time at the university, Anne has demonstrated the essence of what we call a Bradford academic. She's committed, she cares passionately about the university and her colleagues, and steps up at every occasion without any question to do anything that she needs to do to make sure her students and her colleagues are supported. Anne was awarded a BSc in Biochemistry and Pharmacology from Strathclyde University. She then completed a PhD in Medical Biochemistry at the University of Glasgow. She is determined and passionate not only about her academic discipline, but about her students and colleagues and university. And as I said, she often puts on her own ambitions second place to supporting others and her faculty. She's an active member of the university committees and Anne, I can tell you, always makes sure her views are heard. <laughs> and many of her views of her colleagues as well. And I hope that you're not too surprised about that. <laughs> um, so Anne's citizenship even extended to when I can remember being the chair of the Health and Safety Working Group. And Anne was a representative of the Faculty on Health and Safety, and it was a champion for it. However, I recently learned that Bess may have had something to do with an incident during the early phase of her PhD. Anne was tasked with using sodium as a catalyst. So I'm sure all of the biochemists in the room know that sodium will spontaneously combust or even explode when exposed to small amounts of water in the air. Wow, Anne's sodium somehow found its way into the sink. <laughs> and it wasn't a dry one causing a burst of flames without rushing for a bucket of sand to stop them spreading. Anne says she's much more careful now, and I don't, I'm not aware of any other incident that's happened whilst at the University of Bradford, and none of her 18 PhD graduates have caused any similar explosions. <laughs> so in postdoc research funded by the British Health Foundation, Anne discovered her passion for cardiovascular studies. She studied how cell signals control inflammatory uh, and growth responses in cells, and she's going to talk about this. And these cells importantly <coughs> line blood vessels. Her work was published in the British Journal of Pharmacology and became the fundamental basis of her career at Bradford. On arrival, Anne discovered and struggled with the Yorkshire accent. <laughs> And, re and the accent of her first PhD student coming from Wakefield. She solved this cultural divide by running Scottish. Kayleigh. Kayleigh. Yes. Kayleigh. Yes. Yeah. said it twice, I've got to say it wrong. <coughs> in a seminar room. Diversity and inclusion, as I said, was always in her blood from the beginning. So, in the Department of Biomedical Science, Anne led collaborative work with skin scientists interested in skin pigmentation even before the Centre for Skin Sciences was developed at Bradford. As the current Head of School of Chemistry and Biosciences, Anne has progressed from a new recruit at Bradford to the leader of nearly 50 staff and 500 students, and she continues to run an active research group. I've just been saying to Anne just a few moments ago, I was really worried that we had to be sure she wanted to be the Head of School because I know what she's like about stepping up to do a good job for us. But I know that Anne in this role will make great steps forward for our school. Anne has been a rock solid contributor to the faculty as interim head of medical sciences before it merged, and an associate dean in research and knowledge transfer, leading the university's research excellence framework 2021 submission for the subjects allied to health. Outside the university, Anne is an active member of a wider research community, regularly serving on grant panels. She's edited the Journal of Inflammation for 15 years, reviews articles for multiple journals, and is a fellow of the Institute of Biomedical Sciences 
and has been named a member of the organizing committee of the World Congress of Inflammation, North of England Cell Biology Group. And these are the heads of the universities of the Biomedical Science Conference in the UK Council for Graduate Education. So I could go on at length about Anne's achievements with us and her impact on patient care and her links with local clinicians. And these have improved patient outcomes. We cannot underestimate the impact of Anne's research and especially impact on patient outcomes. However, I know that we're all keen to hear from Anne and about her work on inflammatory mechanisms that has improved our understanding of how inflammation causes heart attacks. I will close with just a few words about Anne and her mentorship. As a result of her keen and attentive mentorship, she has graduated, as I said at the beginning, 18 PhD researchers. And mind you, she was so busy chatting and collaborating, she missed a flight. She's so keen to keep people engaged. And we applaud you in terms of what you've achieved today. We congratulate you on becoming a professor and invite you to give your inaugural lecture on the endothelium as a critical regulator of inflammation in disease. Thank you. The Vice Chancellor has got notes. I'm having some notes. Thank you very much, Shirley. It's a real pleasure uh, to be able to give this first inaugural talk of this relaunch series. Uh, and I'm hoping that there aren't going to be any this is your life moments, uh, <laughs> although I know there's plenty of people in the audience in the room and in the audience on Zoom who could probably tell an embarrassing story or two. But I am touched that so many of you have been able to come along tonight. Um, and thanks especially to those people that are watching online. You don't even have the promise of raising a glass over some tasty Burns Night themed snacks after the talk to keep you engaged. So thank you very much. So tonight, although I've done lots of different research, some of it does impact on patient outcomes. I've decided to focus on the laboratory research that I spent most of my career doing. So that's these amazing cells that I hope I'm going to be able to convince you of that line the blood vessels. Because this is what most of my groups uh, have been working on. So little did I think when I got my PhD in 1991 with big 80s here, that it would lead me to become an academic professor uh, many years later. And there are many, many photographs of my time at Bradford, but I thought the most appropriate one was when uh, the communications team decided I should be one of the poster girls when uh, University of Bradford hosted the National Science Festival. So lots of people think that this is what biochemists do sit in front of racks of test tubes with beautifully coloured solutions in them. I have to admit, this was entirely set up for the press uh, and it's coloured water in each of those tubes rather than actually in chemicals. So when I received my chair, uh, then it's true that I've been really proud to support Bradford's initiative, encouraging uh, young women to come into science and study STEM subjects. Uh, downstairs, some of you might have seen when you came in, that there is a wall of female professors at the university, uh, and this photo is up there as well, and that initiative is called This Prof Can, and we're extremely proud of that initiative. So tonight, I know that there are some vascular biologists in the audience here or uh, online, but uh, for you, I'm afraid this is not going to be a very technical talk. And I can see my family breathing a sigh of relief. <laughs> because there are many people who are not vascular scientists or even uh, laboratory scientists at all in the audience. I hope that I don't confuse you with too much jargon and I'm keeping my fingers crossed 
we have tested the technology that the video clips later on work and um, that they're easy to understand. So first of all, I'm afraid I do have to go in a little bit to lecture mode and tell you a little bit about the structure of the blood vessel and the importance of the endothelium. So basically, our blood vessels are tubes that transport blood around the body. The muscles, which are these um, cells underneath, the endothelium contracts and relax and prevents us from fainting when we get up from lying down. Uh, and also because of signals that come from the brain, the nervous system, and also from the tissues themselves, then they help to regulate a healthy response most of the time until disease kicks in. So I work with many people that are experts in uh, the smooth muscle, but I'm most interested in this single layer of cells which helps to uh, relax blood vessels. And we know that if we um, do an experiment in the forearm of patients and we inhibit the function of these cells, blood pressure goes up. So they definitely produce soluble factors that diffuse out and relax the muscle. And they play a really important role during uh, acute inflammation so if we come across an infection, these endothelial cells will uh, cause a small part of the vascular system uh, to pro promote an inflammatory response, but not throughout the whole system. Uh, so they become activated. And I'll go through a little bit what um, the process for that is. Uh, so I hope that you can follow it. Now, this is a cartoon straight out of a textbook. So real cells, don't look like this. So we get isolated cells uh, donated by either patients or volunteers from blood vessels. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But this next picture demonstrates what the cells look like um, when we isolate them and uh, look at their structure in the lab. So what you can see here is uh, the nucleus that contains the genetic material is stained in blue. And We've seen a protein on the surface of the cell here in green. And you can see that these cells, uh, there's many of them, are all quite close together, but there are gaps between them. Now, in the body, there wouldn't be these gaps. The endothelium makes a really tight uh, junction surface so that only very tiny molecules can get through. No cells can escape, uh, and that stops any um, inflammation or damage within the tissue and these cells regulate inflammation. So they do that by um, when uh, an inflammatory insult happens, then uh, white blood cells, immune cells, are able to stick to the surface and then squeeze through because there's vascular permeability induced. They also play a really important role in uh, controlling how platelets that stop blood loss are able to stick to the blood vessel wall. They only do that when the endothelium is damaged or absent and there's been a, a, a cut or an injury to the blood vessel. <laughs> and then they can also remodel the vascular system, so contributing to high blood pressure. And they can also develop new blood vessels, which is particularly important in cancer, where um, the supply of blood plays a critical role uh, in the development and the progression of the tumour. So from when, uh, and uh, so next I'm going to show you, go through step by step what the inflammatory processes are, so that when I show the video, you can follow it quite easily and quickly. So, oops, not like that, press the wrong button. And we can see it in the Okay, so this is the endothelium. And if you imagine this is the muscle cell and the muscle layer underneath, and blood would be flowing across here. Then what we have is there's a small number of adhesion molecules that nothing sticks to in the blood. Uh, however, if the cells are stimulated with inflammatory factors, and there are many, many of these, I've only chosen to focus on the ones that I'm going to talk about tonight. So high glucose as in diabetes, 
or an amino acid known as homocysteine, uh, or uh, free radicals uh, called reactive oxygen species, which is to do with higher oxidative stress. In the presence of one or more than one of these factors, then within a few minutes, uh, the first thing that happens is an adhesion molecule called P-selectin pops up, and then within an hour or so, another adhesion molecule known as E-selectin appears, followed by uh, genes being switched on to make more of this yellow ICAM. All of this makes the cell very sticky, and the cell also produces soluble factors which attract even more immune cells to the site where the injury is. So we've been measuring um, how this process progresses. So initially, uh, that P-selectin enables the white blood cells, the immune cells, just to touch the endothelium cell layer. Normally, they wouldn't stick in a healthy endothelium. And then the presence of the E-selectin means it starts to roll slowly across the endothelium which allows the white blood cells to become activated. Uh, and then the next thing that happens is they then stick to the endothelium because they want to get into the tissue to try to eradicate the infection. Uh, and in order to do that, they need to crawl until they find a gap between the endothelium that now becomes permeable. And then the last step is that they're able to crawl through that gap uh, and then they get into the tissue. So that's great. Uh, acute inflammation only occurs for a short period of time and is then eradicated. But I'm interested in chronic cardiovascular disease. And in chronic cardiovascular disease, most of the inflammatory stimuli are in the blood, causing all these activation steps, but there's no damage in the tissue for the white blood cells to travel to. So they start to accumulate in the blood vessel wall and what happens then is eventually they pick up lots of cholesterol and then what was a nice clear tube becomes blocked, which you probably can't see very well, it's quite little. Um, so this is a section taken through the artery of a small child. And you can see here, even though the section is uh, not quite a nice circle, because uh, it's been squeezed a little as the section's been taken and died. But you can see that there's plenty of space for blood to flow through. Contract this, contrast this, sorry, with a blood vessel taken from someone that's had a heart attack. Now here, what you can see is that instead of there being a nice um, area for the blood to flow through, there's lots of buildup of debris, tissue, cells, and the only place that the blood can flow is this tiny little channel here. And for those people that have uh, angina, then that's caused by the lack of oxygen to the heart muscle, which comes from these uh, blockages in the artery. So the types of chronic inflammatory diseases that I'm interested in studying, and I'm going to talk about tonight, are high glucose and diabetes, then uh, high levels of an amino acid known as homocysteine, uh, which is found in around 40% of people diagnosed with atherosclerosis and heart disease. Um, chronic inflammatory diseases where there's high levels of inflammatory cytokines like rheumatoid arthritis, which is very high levels of tumor necrosis factor. Psoriasis also has lots of inflammatory cytokines. And I've done some work looking at the vascular components, uh, components of psoriasis. Now, advancing medicine is a wonderful thing. Um, it means that our lifespan is much, much longer than it was 100 years ago. But one of the consequences of that is, of course, that we're all aging. And as the body ages, then low level inflammation starts to build up over years and years. So aging is uh, also thought to develop as a chronic inflammatory disease, leading to the development of um, uh, atherosclerosis, which is the precursor to heart attacks and strokes. And these can happen without any warning whatsoever. People may not have uh, been diagnosed 
uh, with the disease before. And that's one of the scary things about cardiovascular disease, sometimes known as a silent killer. But I'm a biochemist, and so what I'm interested in is I really want to understand those uh, mechanisms which are responsible for causing the blockages in the arteries. And so for much of my career, I've been uh, looking at changes in proteins within the cells. And more recently, we've started to be able to examine uh, how gene expression is switched on, leading to these changes in proteins. And we can start to work at the level of uh, RNA, and people will know that the COVID vaccines are based on a messenger RNA, which is the message for proteins, the spike protein being made. So in addition to those messages that make proteins, the body also has long sections of RNA which don't actually code for any proteins. We used to think these were called junk DNA. What we now know is that they're non-coding RNA, but they're able to bind to the messages that should make proteins and inhibit the production of certain proteins. So understanding the mechanisms for me means that we can find drug targets, which we then are able to tell the medicinal chemists about, so they can develop the small molecule drugs, which might be proteins, might be peptides, could be antibodies, which can be used in preventing or reversing disease. Now, in an ideal world, we'd be able to study this in human subjects. But if you're doing cardiovascular research, I haven't had too many volunteers offering to give me some blood vessels because we obviously need them to survive. But uh, that means uh, that it's difficult to study blood vessels, but we do get donor tissue um, that has been donated after operations. Uh, as a biochemist, it's a lot easier to study a simple system. So a lot of my work has been just with the endothelium or with the endothelium in the immune cells or the endothelium in the platelets. Then we can uh, find out single pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that we can then put into more complicated models, whole organisms, and eventually test to see if the principles still hold uh, in patients. So um, we work on human cells, as I said, that have been donated, and we're very dependent on the university's biobank for doing all of the ethical approvals and supplying us with the tissues. Uh, for all of these experiments. Uh, we get cell sources that are the umbilical cords donated by uh, women after they've had their babies. Uh, and those can be from healthy pregnancies or they might be from women with disease if they consent to giving us samples. Uh, we also get the leftover bits of a vein that's in the leg that's used in cardiac artery bypass grafting. So the surgeons always make sure they take plenty of tissue and usually there are some little segments left over that, they, uh, that can be donated for medical research. And so we get those to isolate ourselves from. Um, we can also get them uh, from skin and lymphatic systems. When we're doing studies with endothelial cells and immune cells, then we have to take blood samples. And this is a good friend and colleague of mine uh, who's a trained phlebotomist, he looks very like a trained phlebotomist, checking we have all of the equipment that we need before we go to the phlebotomy suite in order to take a blood sample. So this was he, this, uh, um, this is my, uh, my colleague, Wayne Roberts. He's a platelet specialist. He was doing a diabetes study. I have diabetes, so I was a willing victim to donate some blood to him for a study. Um, so we can have platelets, or we'll have all different types of white blood cells to do our studies on. And then there's loads of different types of experiments that I'll do, and I'm going to show you some of them. Uh, so I'll show you some uh, cultured cells uh, that have undergone inflammation. I'll also show you a couple of videos of cell interactions under flow. And then some of the functional assays. So how the cells are able to be stimulated to grow new blood vessels, uh, to proliferate, to grow, 
um, in the scratch assays, and some diseases will slow down growth. Things like diabetes slows down uh, growth of endothelial cells. On the other hand, cancer speeds it up. So we want to try and regulate how fast these cells grow. And then I can study changes in protein expression in samples from uh, individuals that have underlying diseases. Uh, or if I want to find out exactly where in the cell a protein is located, then we can stain with specific antibodies. And we've also done some work on gene expression as well that I'll talk about towards the end. So I'm going to spend the rest of the time just saying a little um, about some of the studies that we've done. Uh, and the first study that I'm going to talk about uh, involves this amino acid homocysteine. Now, although it's a, it's a very common amino acid, uh, we don't get it from the diet. And inside the body, there is a pathway that generates it from methionine, which is generally um, obtained from meat within a diet or some pulses and seeds for vegetarians. In the blood, it's usually transported, bound to a protein in the blood until it gets into the tissues where it can be incorporated into new proteins. But almost half of the people diagnosed with atherosclerosis, with a higher risk of heart attacks, have elevated levels of this amino acid. So it seems to be linked to low levels of uh, certain B vitamins. Uh, and we were able to try to simulate uh, the, what happens in the blood vessel of a patient with high levels of homocysteine by treating them chronically in the lab. And the next video, uh, the next slide that I'm going to show you shows interactions between the immune cells and the uh, leukocytes. So you can see the, the, um, the endothelial cells are stuck to the dish. These white dots are the, are the immune cells. They don't stick in a healthy uh, sample, but when the cells have been pre-treated with homocysteine, you can see all of these uh, white blood cells that are sticking. You can see them rolling all the things that I showed you earlier on and then firmly sticking. And in a blood vessel, in a person, what would happen next is these uh, immune cells would travel underneath the layer of the endothelium and then would start to build up in the blood vessel wall. And over time, that starts to push out and cause these lesions that narrow the blood vessels. So um, we were able to measure, using specific antibodies, uh, the fact that it, there was definite upregulation of the adhesion molecules that I mentioned before, you can see that in the controls, there's hardly any expression. And then you can see more green color in those um, cells that have had homocysteine on them. And the next thing that we decided we were going to do was try and work out what the mechanism is. So what we found was that um, I had done some work before I came to Bradford on a signaling pathway in the endothelium cells called MAP kinase. And there are several different arms to this pathway. And two of these arms, including this junk pathway, regulate stress within the cells. So we had some evidence that this pathway might be playing an important role in the damage to the endothelium by homocysteine. So we got a hold of an inhibitor uh, from a friend of mine. And what we were able to do, demonstrate is that in the presence of the inhibitor, so these are cells treated with the homocysteine, but this time that they've got the junk inhibitor in, then none of this sticking happened. So it was able to prevent the damage to the activation to the endothelium. Unfortunately, this pathway is in many different cell types. And so because of that, we haven't been able to develop any drugs yet uh, that inhibit this pathway. The PhD students and postdocs that were working in the lab at the time, uh, and there might be some people in the audience that remember this with pain, counted all of those different interactions that you saw in there to generate these graphs of all the separate interactions. Um, so they love me dearly for those experiments. However, 
uh, we were able to, and then they were really happy when they did the inhibitor experiments and the inhibitors worked, didn't take long to count the interactions. So uh, another set of drugs that are commonly prescribed are the cholesterol lowering drugs, statins. So we've also done a bit of work with statins. So very widely prescribed. Um, if people who are in the audience don't mind sharing, um, would, could you let me know if you're happy to share if you are uh, currently prescribed statins? There's a few of us in the audience. <laughs> so um, what we were able to show in similar experiments to this one is that when we added statin to the endothelial cells that were damaged, it did a similar thing to what you just saw with this uh, inhibitor that is only used in the lab. So it's independent of the cholesterol lowering effects. We were able to show that in an article that we published. And so statins are having multiple effects on reducing and potentially reversing inflammation. So I don't quite believe they should be in the drinking water. There are one or two scientific colleagues of mine who think they should be in the drinking water. However, I would not hesitate to recommend statins uh, as a therapy. Uh, they have few side effects and they seem to work really quite well. So because of all this work that I had done on this pathway, uh, the PhD student at the time went to a conference in New Orleans to present this work, which went down very well. And while we were there, we got talking to someone working at National University of Singapore. Uh, and they were interested, their, their subject area in a pathology department was Hodgkin's lymphoma. They were studying Hodgkin's lymphoma and, and this cancer. So they were very interested in whether or not this uh, Matt Kiney's pathway might be playing a role in, um, in helping the lymphoma to drive inflammation because it's a cancer which does have an inflammatory component. At that time, part of my voluntary studies with Bradford in other areas was that I was uh, running a franchised course that was in Singapore with a collaborating institution which meant I was visiting Singapore a couple of times per year to do the quality assurance and do some teaching on the programme and recruit students there. I took this opportunity to sit down with that colleague, develop a grant application, and we got some money to study this. So in this next slide, then what I'm going to show you is the fact that um, one of the PhD students in Singapore was able to travel to Bradford stayed with us a month, learned those techniques that we were using in our lab in order to demonstrate that the JNK Map Kinase pathway was also involved in the spread of Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, the grant that we got for that was an exchange grant. It was a travel grant. So my PhD student went to Singapore for a month uh, and Chi Fu came here for a month. I think my PhD student got the better deal. However, I was assured by the very polite Singaporean PhD student that he had a great time when he was here and learned a lot. So I'm very proud of this paper because uh, this paper was published in a journal known as Blood, which is one of the top cardiovascular journals in the field. Uh, and what made it such a popular article was the fact that the pathology department in Singapore were able to show that this lymphotoxin produced by the cancer cells, which um, was stimulated by the stress kinases, was also found within tumour samples that came from patients. So this definitely happened in the disease. It wasn't just an artefact that we saw within the lab. So they're still working on uh, lymphotoxin as a potential target for new drugs, although I haven't seen that there are any new drugs quite yet that have hit the market, but I keep looking out for it. Next, I wanted to talk a bit about diabetes. So why are we so interested in diabetes in Bradford and in the UK? So the incidence of diabetes has doubled in the last 15 years. Diabetes UK estimate that almost 5 million people have diabetes um, and 90% of those people have got type 2 diabetes. Um, we know 
But in addition to that, again, Diabetes UK charity latest figures say another 13 million people are at high risk of developing type 2 diabetes, and many of those might be undiagnosed. Now, the problem with not being diagnosed with the diabetes is that the high blood glucose levels are able to damage the blood vessels over a series of months and years before diagnosis can then uh, able the medication can then treat the high blood glucose levels. So um, in Bradford, we're really interested in it because diabetes is more prevalent in certain uh, populations, certain different types of ethnic uh, ethnicities, and it's extremely uh, um, prevalent in the South Asian community and with almost 20% of the population in Bradford being of South Asian origin then that may, seems to me to make it a very critical uh, thing to study in order to try and reduce the risks of developing cardiovascular disease. So this again a model shows a healthy blood vessel and how uh, um, the plaque can build up blocking the um, blood flow in diabetes. So there are lots of different mechanisms responsible for this, uh, but we know that increased oxidative stress seems to be a response to the high glucose levels. Um, and it's been shown that antioxidants are able to reduce the cardiovascular symptoms in animal models. Uh, and also in patients, then uh, treatment with the antioxidant vitamin E is able to protect the blood vessels in the kidney and in the eye from damage in response to glucose levels. Sadly, however, we haven't been able to demonstrate in long clinical trials, a number of these over three or five years, that it leads to a reduction in the number of heart attacks in patients that have diabetes. So we haven't solved the problem yet, and there's still plenty to do. Now, getting tissue, blood vessel tissue from people that have diabetes, uh, we don't get too much uh, tissue from those people with type two diabetes because it tends to be diagnosed in the middle of life and later in life. And we depend a lot on tissue from uh, pregnancy. So uh, that tends to be younger women. However, there's a temporary type of diabetes which occurs only in pregnancy called gestational diabetes, only for a few months. And um, the, in Bradford, we screen every woman for gestational diabetes uh, because of our high risk population. So we've been able to get consent from individuals that have gestational diabetes to have a model of um, diabetes to study in the laboratory. So, Another PhD student of mine, um, more recently, then was able to look at these cells uh, in the lab. And first of all, she was able to measure that even this temporary diabetes increased the levels of oxidative stress. So these cells are incubated with a dye, which only becomes fluorescent and detectable on the microscope when it comes into contact with free radicals. Um, so things like superoxide and, and those kind of things that indicate damage. Um, and we also were able to show those adhesion molecules that I showed earlier are also upregulated. Now, these are not cells that have been immediately isolated from the patient. We have taken them out of high glucose conditions and then we've, we've exposed them to normal glucose like you would find in a non-diabetic person. Uh, over a number of weeks, and we still see this persistent uh, damage to the endothelium. So that's quite worrying, uh, because that could have implications for women who had gestational diabetes, but then stopped having diabetes after they delivered the baby. And it may also mean there are consequences for the risk of earlier cardiovascular disease also for the infants that are born from these women because these blood vessels also supply the vascular system in the children. So in addition to the work that we've done uh, on the uh, inflammation in these cells, um, others have also 
done lots of work that suggests that there are epigenetic changes that reprogram those cells so that they become damaged uh, and, and that will be uh, happening uh, for a very, very long time, uh, potentially for the rest of life. Now here at Bradford, we have a real advantage because some of you may already be aware of the fact that there was a very large cohort study um, initiated in Bradford uh, before 2010 called the Born in Bradford study. And in that study, women uh, consented uh, when they were pregnant uh, for their information to be used for a study, but also um, it was agreed that the children of those women would be followed throughout their childhood and into adulthood to monitor their health. The oldest of those children are now at secondary school. And because cardiovascular disease takes many years to develop, it's quite difficult to persuade the funding agencies to give you money to look at something that might develop in 10 years. So I'm hoping to work with the Born and Bradford team once these children are getting to their late teens and early 20s to see if the women who had gestational diabetes, and there were almost a thousand of them in this study, uh, have higher cardiovascular indicators when the, uh, when the children become young adults. So that will be really interesting uh, to follow up and I'll report back on that in due course. We've also looked at um, the fact that these gestational diabetes endothelial cells seem to show biomarkers that would suggest that it's as if they've come from a much uh, older person than we would expect, not someone in their twenties or thirties. So when the endothelial cells have grown and split for, uh, and, and divided lots and lots of times, then they come to the end of their lifetime. They don't die, but instead they undergo a process called senescence. And what senescence is, is the cells just stop dividing. They sit there, but they don't do nothing. They become inflamed and they start to produce uh, inflammatory markers. Uh, and working together with Kirsten Richie Suman, who's a smooth muscle cell expert to complement the endothelial cell work that I do, then we showed that both the endothelium and the smooth muscle cells from these gestational diabetes patients uh, show features as if it might be from a 60 or 70 year old person instead of a young woman. Um, so I was lucky enough to uh, be funded by uh, the Dean, Alistair Goldman, to go to a meeting to present this work. So I went off to Krakow in um, 2019, before the pandemic, and presented the work at the Federation of European Biochemistry meeting, uh, where I was able to talk to collaborators about future work in this area. Now I could talk about diabetes and inflammation for the rest of the night. However, I'm going to move swiftly on so that I've got a few minutes to talk about one or two of the other studies that we've done. So I'm just going to skip over that one quickly, which is mechanistic. So um, I also worked with a clinician dermatologist based mainly at, um, at Leeds, but who did a part-time contract with us at Bradford working with skin sciences. And she had shown that she had identified some of the inflammatory factors known as interleukins that play a pathological role in psoriasis. So we funded a PhD student who then was able to investigate whether there were links to the cardiovascular system uh, and whether the cells responded to this inflammatory factor. So sure enough, our cells can bind to this inflammatory marker and it causes activation of the cells. And then it switches on the genes, which then produce um, a classical factor, which makes new blood vessels develop. So one of the features of psoriasis lesions is that uh, you get the development of lots of new blood vessels. And that's one of the reasons why the uh, lesions are so uncomfortable and, 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 and can be so painful because it's a, it's a massive inflammatory response. So these little pictures here show um, the fact that when in vitro we try to mimic skin by growing the endothelium together with some skin fibroblasts, then um, in the absence of any of these inflammatory factors, you don't see the development of little tubes. When you put this inflammatory factor in, can you see 
how you can see these little thread-like structures. These are little capillaries that are developing. And here at the bottom, we have the positive uh, control, which is the classical growth factor that we know induces massive amounts um, of new blood vessel development. And we were able to show in a paper that was published a few years ago that um, this inflammatory cytokine actually switches on the gene to make uh, the VEGF, which then means that it's going to make lots and lots of um, new blood vessels. Now, we weren't able to get any samples of blood vessels from psoriasis patients. Any kind of trauma or stress for a psoriasis patient could trigger an attack, but we were able to get some blood. So we, in the blood from these patients, then this time we looked at macrophages, which are inflammatory cells, which uh, are phagocytes that try and eat up any kind of infection that's going on. And we mimicked an, a, um, a psoriasis attack by treating them with this interleukin. And then we isolated everything that they, uh, that they secreted into the media. And then we added it to endothelial cells. And here we have, again, our good old adhesion molecules that have, uh, are, are shown bright green um, in the uh, samples that were taken from the psoriasis patients. Now, it's an inflammatory factor even for healthy um, macrophages, but not nearly as much. You can see that, uh, that it's much stronger in the other ones. So staying on the theme of new blood vessel development, then platelets are also known when they're activated to stimulate new blood vessel development. And working with Wayne Roberts a collaborator and, and Jim Boyne, collaborators now both at Leeds Beckett, um, then the platelet expert and the molecular biology expert then uh, we had a PhD student who was looking at the, um, how activated platelets release these tiny little microparticles, uh, only between 50 and 100 nanometers in size, so very tiny. They can get into the endothelium, and in the absence of these, again, you can see there are no tubes uh, growing, but in the presence of these microparticles, you can see again the development of these capillaries through which blood would be able to flow. We were trying to work out what the mechanism of that might be. Um, so what we first of all did was that um, we looked at whether or not it was uh, due to proteins. There's lots of different uh, uh, contents in these uh, microparticles. And then what we were able to show was that if we got rid of RNA, then we were able to block. So this time, this is treated with the microparticles. So you can see again, like this one, lots of the tubes forming uh, where blood could flow. If we got rid of RNA, then it blocked the production of these tubes. So we're looking for an RNA target. And the PhD student did lots of research on published work that had been done and came up with a good candidate that we could test. So one of the things, one of the micro RNAs that can reduce expression of proteins is known as LET7. So we got some inhibitors of LET7 and then we tested whether or not what the impact of that was um, on the endothelial uh, on the endothelial cells that have been treated with the platelet mic microparticles. So this time, uh, we could take just the microRNA itself, and we were able to also show that the tubes formed if we took just this pure um, microRNA that we know is present in in the particles, uh, and then. Um, we were able to block that by uh, adding something that would um, knock out the LET7 selectively. So, uh, the, from this perspective, then this works really important because the new blood vessels that develop could be in an atherosclerotic lesion and could contribute towards its possibility of rupture, causing a heart attack. Uh, so we might want to manipulate how platelets impact on cardiovascular disease, but also it's known that activated platelets 
also play a role in driving cancer progression. And that's something that my colleague Wayne is working on more at the moment. So where have I taken you so far? Then in my career up until this point, I've characterized some new biochemical pathways. Well, they were new then in human endothelial cells. We knew about them in other cell types. And then we're always looking for good targets to design new drugs. We've also looked at more complicated models than just a single cell type that we grow in the lab. So we've been able to look at the interactions of endothelial cells with immune cells and with platelets and the role of those in cardiovascular disease. So what's next in the last few minutes? Then I've still got an active research group. So we're pursuing some of the work on the microparticles this time working closely with Wayne microparticles that come from colorectal cancer cells and we're going to be studying all the tube formation etc uh, with this PhD student. I still want to do lots more work on the gestational diabetes cells and the role in aging and whether or not we could do anything to prevent that aging happening as well as the Born and Bradford study that I'm planning. Um, I was able to attend an online conference during the summer where I got talking to a bioengineer and they've developed a 3D printed bioreactor which can support living blood vessels from pig models of cardiovascular disease for up to two weeks. So the obvious question was, have you tried this with human blood vessels? They hadn't. And she said, I'd really love to collaborate. So uh, we're writing a grant at the moment which we hope will get funded, where we'll be able to get some of those bioreactors and then try and optimise it. So we've got a whole tissue model to try and study whether we can start to block the development of cardiovascular disease. Now, I've not talked tonight at all about the work that I've been doing that's out of the lab, but Shirley did mention patient outcomes earlier. So I've been co-supervising some PhD students who are trying to support patients with diabetes to feel more in control of their diabetes. So uh, developing systems for them to uh, feel confident about managing their own blood glucose levels. Um, and one of those PhDs, there are two PhD students that have graduated and uh, one of them at the moment is part-time. She's a full-time pharmacist down in London and she's a diabetes specialist pharmacist. And so we're going to be doing some studies uh, looking at how we can try and design tools that will help the patients easily understand the diabetes and feel more in control. And my other PhD student is a computational graduate. Now, through my work on gestational diabetes, I set up a collaboration with a clinical group in Bangladesh who were very interested in this uh, patient management support for women with gestational diabetes. And those gestational diabetic women are managed and control their diabetes to within an inch of their life with lots of clinical input. We want to try and see whether those very well controlled patients uh, have much less risk of having to need a cesarean section because the babies are very big or of adverse outcomes of the pregnancy. So what Sumaya is doing is uh, we've done some modeling with the Born and Bradford data set to try and see whether machine learning can predict for us what the factors are that are able to determine whether women are more likely to need a cesarean section or not. If we can find that out, when there's still eight or 10 weeks to go, then we can put in place support mechanisms to help reduce the consequences of the diabetes. So uh, she's the expert on computational stuff. Uh, I give her the health knowledge. Uh, she has a computational professor as her other supervisor. When they start talking computation, I listen. I don't have much to contribute. So my last sort of couple of slides really, uh, just indicate all of the people who uh, have been responsible for achieving all of this work really. So uh, these are some of the PhD students, uh, graduates that I have. 
Uh, the ones that are indicated in blue are the ones whose work I've talked about tonight. Uh, but I've also done some work on microbe and epithelial cells, so gut cell signaling, uh, as well as pure platelet signaling, um, and worked a bit with uh, the Centre for Skin Sciences with Professor Julie Thornton on co-supervising some uh, project uh, PhDs in that area. It's also really, really important uh, to thank all my collaborators. So those fruitful scientific discussions that I have with uh, either basic scientists or clinicians, um, and there are a mixture of those on here, help us to find out what the right questions are that we need to answer that solve the clinical problems. And at the bottom here are just uh, some, uh, these are some of the funders that have funded some of the work that I've had. So, um, for the last 30 years since I've been working on cardiovascular disease, my father, who had a heart bypass over 20 years ago, says to me, every time I see him, have you cured heart disease yet? I hope that I've showed you how it's quite complicated. <laughs> and I may have lost you along the way. Uh, however, I think that cardiovascular disease is going to keep a lot of researchers working for many more years. Um, and I think that I just wanted to finish off by saying it has indeed been a bit of a journey. From glamorous conferences in places such as Hull, all the way to Melbourne in Australia with Krakow in between and many other locations like New Orleans and, and, and San Francisco where we missed the flight. Um, and then some of the graduates, some colleagues, who are, in the, who are in the audience. Old and new, some colleagues who can't be with us anymore. And all the team building exercises that we do, including our experience as the drug squad at the Dragon Boat Festival two years ago. So we're planning to do that again. We're looking for sponsorship uh, for the 2022 Dragon Boat Festival, if it goes ahead. And so thank you very much for your attention.